Peter 1, verses 8 and 9, we read, Though you, sorry, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with expressible joy and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith and salvation of your souls. Father God, we come before you today in humble adoration. May your Holy Spirit envelop us with pure joy in the expectation of our life to come with you in your heavenly kingdom. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for you, Jesus, being prepared to come into this cruel and sinful world to ultimately suffer a barbaric death on the cross for the benefit of us all, despite you being completely free from sin yourself. Thank you for the Bible, which gives us guidance as to how we should conduct our lives, and honour you, our Creator. May your Holy Spirit help us to navigate through passages in the Bible that we find difficult, so that we might, might find its true meaning. Help us in our prayer time to lay before you our worries and concerns, in the knowledge that you will honour and deal with them appropriately, whilst not forgetting to praise and glorify your holy name. Lord Jesus, with the guidance that you provide, may we travel the path on which you direct us, rather than the wrong one. May we seize opportunities as they arise to bring your name, Jesus, in the conversation, rather than let them pass by. We pray for our families, especially those members who have drifted away and find that there is no need for you in their lives. May you, Jesus, be a guiding light to them, to see you and all what you have to offer, rather than them going through life being ignorant of what you can provide. Thank you, Lord, for the body of Christians here at St Andrews Oakington. We are truly blessed with having James, our vicar. May you continue to be the centre of his life, and also with Ben Phillips, our family worker, and many gifted individuals who preach the word on your behalf. We pray for our Queen Elizabeth shortly to celebrate her 70th year on the throne. May you continue to be central to her life and to be able to give guidance to our Prime Minister and steer, steer him in the right direction. We pray for Oakington and the surrounding villages. The coronavirus will release its hold, particularly on the primary school. We do pray that this pan pandemic may burn itself out and provide a safe passage through our turbulent lives. May you, Lord Jesus, provide stamina and determination to all those working in the NHS to see the job through. We give thanks for the financial support that the congregation here have provided to help with projects such as Tanzania and Uganda, as well as through Faith Mission, Christians Concern and Barnabas Fund. Help us through prayer to enable the, the money to be applied effectively in the areas most needed. With so many problems in the world at the moment, it's only you, Jesus, that can resolve them. We ask that you apply your effective power to overcome them, especially with the current situation on the border with Russia and Ukraine. So many Christians in recent times have been targeted for their beliefs in you, Lord Jesus. And we hope and pray that you would enable them to come through their own ordeals with the aid of your Holy Spirit. We offer up these prayers to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jesus, thank you that you love us, the body of Christ. And I pray that as we now hear what, what, what I ask, that, uh, that it will be what you speak, what you are saying to the church. The church is in Jesus' name.
actually uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, um, although I'm going to start at chapter 2, verse 17. You can follow it in the Church Bible, that's what we'll come on to. You may see one or two differences, but I don't, I don't know what page it is, so it's Malachi, chapter 2, verses 17 to chapter 3, verse 5. It's the last book of the Bible. <coughs> Sorry, I'm also reading New King James Version. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, in what way have we wearied him? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or where is the God of justice? Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. <laughs> then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former years. And I will come near you for judgment. I will be swift, I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers. <clears throat> and those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien, because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Right at the start, I think it's important to highlight that the prophet Malachi was speaking to the collective people of God, those who together make up or made up the nation of Israel. This is really important as the church often adopts the culture of the nation. And with our society currently very individualistic, the church often thinks in individualistic terms, whereas Malachi was talking to the collective. <coughs> Further, Malachi was talking to the people of God. His words were directed at the, if you like, those who made up in, in our terminology, the church. So he wasn't talking to the pagan nations that surrounded Israel. This was a message to the collective people of God. So Malachi chapter 2 verse 17. The people of God complain, saying to God, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Any nation or people group which declares bad things as good, and conversely, things that are good as bad, is in trouble. So any nation which calls abortion of a 24-week-old 24 24 child as good and enshrines such things in law is in trouble. Any nation which calls all sorts of perverted sexual relationships as good is in trouble. Any nation that prescribes the lethal cocktail of midazolam and morphine on its elderly members of society, calling it end-of-life care, 
is in trouble. The people's complaint continues, where is the God of justice? This is a good question. And we probably also wonder ourselves why the wicked appear to prosper. I know that I, for one, want to see good God bring about his justice, bring about justice on earth and execute judgment on those people who I perceive as anti-Christian evildoers. Well, the good news is that God will execute justice. But as we shall see, on his terms and not ours. So Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. It was this verse why I specifically chose to read from the New King James Version. Because the New King James Version started with the word behold. In the 1984 NIV version, they translated it as see. And in the 2011 NIV, which is the Pew Bible, there's no such reference any, anywhere. They've completely taken that whole reference out. But the word behold, which is in the New King James, is really important. Because it's effectively saying, or the prophet is effectively saying, or God is effectively saying, stop, listen, and pay very close attention. In other words, what is about to be said is of the utmost importance and we, the people of God, will do very well to listen. I've got two asides here, just to, it's interesting how uh, translations of the Bible are weakening the message. I, I saw something in the week and uh, the question was, why did Jesus come? This is a complete aside to what I was really talking about, but it, it does highlight the issue. So why did Jesus come? Well, in Luke chapter 9, verse 56, in the New King James Version, we can read, <clears throat> For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village, and that's talking about the disciples. In the NIV, this is what Luke chapter 9, verse 56 says, Exactly the same verse. Then he and his disciples went to another village. So the whole translation has taken out from the NIV to the, or taken out from the original King James Version, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So the whole reason why Jesus has came has been completely um, eliminated from the NIV. And there's many other verses similar to that, um, all the way scattered all the way through. So we have to be very careful. On, a, on the transcript, the biblical narrative that we're reading. Second aside, sorry, is uh, going back to the word behold. Malachi uh, is God's final message to Israel for 400 years. So this is the very last word that was said. And God knew that after this, there would be 400 years of silence. And uh, the very last part of the aside is that I did hear it fairly recently that the blank page between the Old Testament and the New Testament is really there to demonstrate God's silence. So going back to behold. <clears throat> Malachi 3 verse 1. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. So God is saying that he is going to send a messenger, his messenger, who will prepare the temple, the people of God, make right the way the ways before the Lord comes himself. And uh, later on in Malachi, chapter 4, verse 5, <coughs> uh, the prophet says, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Matthew chapter 11, verse 10 identifies this initial messenger as John the Baptist. It says, Matthew 11 verse 10 says, This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you 
who will prepare your way before you. To be fair, John the Baptist came preaching a message of repentance. But he did actually say, as it's recorded in John 1 verse 21, that he was not Elijah. But we can take it uh, as true that he did come. John the Baptist did come in the spirit and ministry of Elijah. So to prepare us for the coming of the Lord, what would the message be to us? I think those three bullet points I said earlier must have something to do with it. But also unbelief. The church or the people of God, unbelief is completely rife these days. The book of Malachi starts with the people of God doubting God and his word. So in chapter 1 verse 2, God says, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? The people of God doubted that God loved them. And I guess for us today, do we really believe that God loves us? Because if we doubt that, what other sins are lurking around? Because God has declared his love for us. So to think that God doesn't love us is actually a sin. So what else is there? And Malachi, as many other instances throughout the book of Malachi, um, talking of uh, uh, the people's contradictory uh, questions back to God. So God says one thing and then the people say, but, dot, dot, dot. So out of, the out of the mouth, the heart speaks. If people don't believe that God loves them, then what other sins are, are under the surface? And similarly for today, God's love for us, his love is real. But it's real with a view of the real gravity, uh, the real belief in what is to come, in judgment. So when I say the church doesn't believe or is walking in unbelief, do we believe in eternal damnation and judgment? We've already read in Malachi chapter 2 verse 17, which is starts by reading, uh, has another of these contradictory questions with people asking, where is the God of justice? In other words, why do, people, why do the ungodly appear to uh, prosper? Why doesn't God just turn up and stop and destroy all the evil uh, doers? If God is God, why doesn't he just do dot, 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 whatever we want him to do? Well, this is a fair question, particularly when we as individuals consider ourselves at the centre of our own universe. The very few, uh, first few words in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. I think those four words puts everything else into context. In the beginning, God. We are not the centre of our own universe. This corrects the thought process all the way through. Jesus is the centre of creation. As a bit of another aside, uh, a bit of an antidote to the whole kind of mass universe, uh, universe thing. You know, there's a real propensity within society these days, and within the church, we, we do follow what society talks about. There's, we talk about the magnitude of the universe, and you know, huge sizes of planets and all the rest of it. Well, this all makes humans very insignificant. Is that a deception? Is, I mean, is, is the whole enormity of the universe a deception that decries and reduces uh, humans? Because we are the pinnacle of God's created order. He looked at us and said, you are very good. And so when we just look at Hollywood and all the rest of it, that planet, blah, 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 it reduces us. And yet we are God's pinnacle creation. 
the messenger comes to God's temple to bring repentance. For us in our day, this is to establish a right view of God and his ways. To turn from our individualistic approach to Christianity to believe God's word regarding his love for us and including a right view of sin, righteousness and judgment. Now, the book of Malachi has some good news for us. Well, good news and bad news, actually. Sorry, good news and bad news. The good news is, God is coming. The bad news is, he gets it. God is coming. God is coming to his temple, and the prophet asks, who can endure the day of his coming? Well, of course, this is a rhetorical question, because no one can stand when God turns up. God's messenger is his son, Jesus. He comes as a launderer's soap and as a, and as a refiner of fire, a refiner, a purifier of silver. On his return, the first task which God speaks of is refining the Levites. The Levites were the descendants of Jacob's son Levi, and they were selected to serve God in the temple. Priests were Levites, but also lesser roles uh, were filled by the descendants of Levi, including those who served in peripheral, peripheral roles, such as playing music, opening and closing the temple gates, uh, the temple guards, um, people who uh, led worship, people who rung the bells, people who served coffee, they were all people who served in the temple. And God's initial task was to come and purify those. Silver is purified at 800 degrees centigrade. That's hot. So if God comes to pur purify those who are central to the life of the temple, or in other words, those who organise and facilitate worship, as well as the worshippers themselves. Worship is central to the Christian life, as it rightfully honours God and brings us, God's people, into his presence. May I pose a question? Did, did the events related to COVID-19 need the worship of the church. To protect life, the church closed its doors and thereby stopped what God declares as proper worship of him. Could this be another example of the inversion of good and bad? We said something was good, actually it's bad. <coughs> Just a thought, does the church fear COVID-19 more than Jesus Christ? Whose name is more often upon our lips? Is it COVID-19 or is it Jesus? In our passage, God was looking to re-establish acceptable offerings within the temple, as in days gone by, as in former years. In former years, there were indeed acceptable offerings made. We can read about them all the way through uh, Exodus with Moses. But equally, in our day, within Christianity, um, there really were some good stuff from years ago. Spurgeon and the likes. In fact, anything really up until perhaps prior 1950. Because I think what I've found over the last couple of years, really, anything post-1950 is so full of Darwinism, you even adopted in the church. That whole view, you know, the whole thing of the universe and all that, it's all Darwinism at the very basic basis of it. So anything prior to that is really rich and uh, drips with spirituality, and drips with spiritual life. In Malachi's day, the people were seeking the Lord's return. The people didn't understand what his return would actually mean. Anyone who in our day is longing for God's return probably equally doesn't understand what they're actually asking for. Perhaps we're really thinking 
about Jesus coming in our own uh, selfish, individualistic way. God will put right all those things which I think are wrong. But within Malachi, in four, chapter 4, verse 5, it says the day of the Lord is referenced as the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Have we ever considered this the great and dreadful day of the Lord? Would your son come, Lord Jesus, the great and dreadful day of the Lord? That day will be a day of great torment. Jesus will come to judge his people. Our celebrations of Advent, Christmas and even Epiphany are all great celebrations. However, all of them unfortunately tend to look back, look at Jesus' first coming. Perhaps it's time the church believes and looks for his second coming and understand what actually is uh, what we are asking for. Because God will bring about his justice. He will come and cleanse his temple. But as Colossians chapter 3 verse 25 says, he will show no partiality. His judgment will be like the refining of silver at 800 degrees centigrade. Uh, in my NIV, Amos chapter 5 verses 18 to 20, the day of the Lord. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion, only to meet a bear. As though he entered his house and rested his hand upon a wall, only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light? Pitch dark without a ray of any brightness. So Malachi chapter 3 verse 5. So I will come and put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against you, or against various acts of unrighteousness, ungodliness. <clears throat> Sin does need challenging and cleansing from the God's temple, from us, from the people of God. <clears throat> There's a whole list of sins that God particularly mentions to the people in Malachi's day. And the first of those is sorcery. And in our sophisticated world, it's easy to uh, think that we're not, in, we're not involved in sorcery. We're living in 2022, you know, we're perhaps somewhere else, they do sorcery, but not us. Well, there's a really good film available on YouTube, which is uh, all about Walt Disney. And uh, Walt Disney basically is full of sorcery. It's taught us that there's good magic and bad magic. But it's all magic, it's all sorcery, of which God says is wrong. And yet Christianity and Christians, whether we're parents or grandparents, we think nothing of it to put our kids in front of a Walt Disney film. It's sorcery. God is coming to cleanse that from his people. And you may forget everything else I've said, but you won't forget this one to do with Walt Disney. Mary Poppins is a witch. Continuing in Malachi chapter 3 verse 5. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against all the acts of ungodliness. But do not fear me, says the Lord. The fear of God is sadly missing from the, much of what we call Christianity these days. And standing up here, it would be easy to go through various biblical texts and say what the fear of God is. But I think it's incumbent on us all, as the collective, but within individuals as well, but collectively, that we seek God and learn for us what the true fear of God is, what it looks like. But I will leave you with Psalm 34, verses 7 to 11. 
the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want in those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, you children, listen to me, says the Lord, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Thank you. 